The Nephilim king, Abba Bashan, is one of the most mysterious figures in the Bible. Well, who was this king? Was he a Nephilim? Why is there a legend about his bedstead that he slept in? And does the Bible reveal that this Nephilim giant had access to secret technology from the fallen angels? Well, we're going to dig into that and much, much more tonight on Thursday Night Theology, which starts right now. Greetings, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, whenever you're watching this, welcome to Thursday Night Theology. It's nighttime right here. And of course, I'm your host, Ryan Peterson, and I just want to welcome you to the program that is about you, about your questions, where we just want to explore the challenging parts of the Bible, the supernatural, Bible prophecy, all the different areas that the church may not cover. We want to cover it right here on Thursday Night Theology. And we have some great questions tonight for those who don't know. I'm your host, Ryan Peterson, uh, author of Judgment of the Nephilim, which we're going to talk about. I have a feeling we're going to get into it a little bit tonight, as well as the final Nephilim. This goes from the from Genesis to Revelation, covering really the war that humanity is in the middle of between God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, the righteous angels, the kingdom of goodness and righteousness that will come and be ushered in forever, and our true enemy, the devil, the fallen angels, the demonic realm. And uh, really, it's a battle that's been going on for, for millennia, and we are in the middle of it. And this is what my books get into. But tonight, I'm going to hopefully use my knowledge, my research to answer your questions. And we have three amazing questions tonight. So that's how the, the format for Thursday Night Theology. Also, um, let's see. Yeah, let's just get to the question. So we have one question about King Og, uh, who, of course, is mentioned in the Old Testament. He was one of the kings who... Uh, Moses actually led the Israelites in battle against before he handed off the baton to Joshua and who fought the wars of Canaan, of course. So we're going to look at this king, this mighty king and Nephilim giant, see what was it about him that made him so unique? You know, there's a passage that even talks about the bed he slept in being on display like a museum item. So what was it about him? And that's question number one. In question number two, we're going to look at the fact that did the Nephilim giants have access to forbidden knowledge, to technology, to the knowledge of the fallen angels, who, of course, were their forefathers, their ancestors. That's question two. Stay tuned for that. I think you're going to find some really exciting uh, revelations there. And then our third question, we're going to switch gears and we're going to look at, uh, you know, in Revelation, where we see these references to the seven spirits of God. What are they? Who are they? Or what are they? We're going to look into those questions. And if time permits, we'll have uh, some Q&A, some live Q&A from those who are attending live as well, if over time permits. So that is the format for tonight. That is the roadmap. So let's see. Um, just in terms of just uh, announcements, housekeeping, with, again, there's so many, there's so much happening in the world. Uh, you know, I mentioned last week, Dr. Michael Heiser, and I'll put up uh, my graphic frame again, uh, again, for prayers for him and for his family. Uh, of course, he has had a tremendous, tremendous influence from all his research, his writing, his books, his numerous, numerous YouTube videos that I'm sure many on here have watched. Uh, continue to pray for him as he deals with stage four pancreatic cancer and his family just to have God's peace. Um, I, I've continued to put the link to the meal train uh, that his family is administering. If you want to just pay for meals to send, you know, dinner or lunch, it's all there in the link in the, I'm sorry, in the description of this video, you can find the link for that. And also we have to, of course, pray for, um, the many victims of the devastating earthquakes in Turkey and in Syria right now. Um, obviously, you know, it's approaching 20,000 fatalities. And so we want to pray obviously for, Recovery for those who are who are wounded, for God's peace and for literal rebuilding. And um, I'll also later on put a, a link also to support uh, the efforts there as well, and as well for the Horn of Africa, Somalia, Ethiopia, which are facing uh, they're on the brink of massive famine as well. So you know, watching the devastation in Turkey, I mean, you immediately think of the Great Tribulation. At least I did. I don't know what everyone else thought. When you see the level of destruction and how just it, you know, cataclysmic and 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 um intense it was. And so we know that you know our time here is fragile, and we have to just share God's word. We have to share 
the good news of the gospel, the good news that Jesus is returning, because we don't know how much time we have on this earth. So with that, um, we went through the questions and let's see, we didn't hit our like challenge last week. I did a 300 like challenge. We did not hit it. I'm going to try it one more time. So let me throw it up here. So again, this is for our replay viewers. If you're watching on replay, welcome. Thank you for watching. And if you want to be a part of winning something too, I didn't mention two live winners. I forgot to mention, of course, if you're, if you're new, two live winners, two live viewers tonight are going to win um, a special prize. It's going to be a free copy of the final Nephilim audiobook. You'll get a free copy just got released last week on Audible and iTunes and other places where audiobooks are sold. So two people at the end of this program are going to win for our live audience, but for the replay audience, who are watching uh, at a different time, don't despair. Here's the like challenge. I'm trying one more time. And you you will have to, the rules are simple. 300 likes on any of my social media platforms. You see them all there. Make a comment. And two commenters will receive a judgment of the Nephilim prize pack. I'll make it something really special. I haven't decided yet, but maybe I'll just put a whole full pack together for replay. How about that? How about the whole, the final Nephilim, the 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 uh, study guide, the documentary, you can get it all. If we hit that 300 like challenge, we've done it once, we can do it again. I believe my Thursday Night Theology family. And that's the last piece of housekeeping is make sure you say hello to each other. This is also a time of fellowship as we get into God's word. Say hello, share where you are from, and um, let's uh, have a great time debating these issues and getting into the Holy Scripture. So with that, we're going to take a look at... Um, our first question, which was, uh, which actually came to us from Justin of the Dig Bible Podcast. I mentioned uh, them last week. I did an interview. I put an interview. I put the link to it last week uh, in the description. I actually did another recent interview with uh, Word of Faith Global Ministries. I did that last week, this past week. The link to that interview was a great discussion on the Nephilim, quantum physics, UFO disclosure. And a lot of other exciting topics, but really, it was a really good um, discussion on those topics. The link for that is also in the description of this video. So but the question from uh, the Dig Bible Podcast Brothers was about King Og of Bashan. And why does he, you know, kind of, why is he described in the way he is? What made him have this significant bed that's essentially 13 and a half feet? So we're going to jump into that. And go right to the text. And I'm thinking we're going to find out some interesting things about King Og that also explains the Nephilim after the flood in general. So I want to really go to the text and see how he's described. And I think explain some concepts about the Nephilim in Scripture that are often, I think, misinterpreted. So let's take a look. Okay, so we're in Deuteronomy chapter 3. And I'm starting right in the introduction of this king and it says when we turned and went up the way to Bashan and Og here he is the king of Bashan came out against us he and all his people and again right here we see to battle at Edri we see right away what I talk about in judgment of the Nephilim the nature of the Nephilim that they are constantly they are enemies of God and God's people so he comes out to attack immediately at Edri and so we're going to continue and the Lord said unto me and this is, of course, Moses speaking, fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into thy hand. And thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. And of course, Sihon was the first king as the Israelites made their way towards the Jordan River to enter the promised land. That was the first king that fought with Sihon, who was also an Amorite. And now they're fighting King Og. So the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og also the king of Bashan, and all his people. And we smote him until none was left to him remaining. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we took not from them. Three score cities, all the regions of Argob, the kingdom of Og and Bashan. All these cities were fenced with high walls, gates, and bars, besides unwalled towns, a great many. And so we're just going to continue in that passage and get to the key thing that I think uh, Justin was hitting on in his description that makes it clear that King Og is a Nephilim giant. So here we're just continuing right in verse six and we read, and we utterly destroyed them as we did unto Sion of Heshbon, utterly destroyed the men and children of the This is a king, right? When we see this is the... the 
the ban, this, this uh, order from God to wipe out all the inhabitants. Why? Again, if you have to understand Genesis 6 and the Nephilim and the, that, that Satan was trying to contaminate human genetics for these passages to really make any sense as to why God would take such a drastic measure. So, um, but continuing, but all the cattle and the spoils of the cities we took for our prey to ourselves. And we took at that time out of the land of the two kings of the Amorites, the land that was on this side, Jordan, from the river of Arnon unto Mount Hermon, which Hermon, the Sidonians call Syrian, and the Amorites call it Shinir. All the cities of the plain and all Gilead and all Bashan unto Salcon and Edrai, cities of the kingdom of Og in Bashan. For only King Og of Bashan remained of the remnant of giants. And as I put there, Rephaim, this is going to be critical to understanding how to interpret this. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbah of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. Just hide right in there. I got my water this week. And again, that's Deuteronomy 3, verses 1 to 11. And so... This is where we see the description, the introduction of King Og. And clearly he's being described as a giant. He has this bedstead, right? We can go back and look at that detail here. It's highlighted. It says that his bedstead was, first of all, made of iron. And it was nine cubits was the length thereof and four cubits the breadth thereof. And so what we're seeing here is, you know, the, the Egyptian cubit, that, that unit of measurement was 18 inches in the ancient world. So that puts his height at roughly, at least the length of his bed, at roughly 13 and a half feet. Excuse me, if you think that a bed is usually, a person's body, their ratio is usually 80% to the length of a bed is the human body. That's saying he's anywhere from 10 to 11 to 11 and a half feet. So this was a massive hybrid being, right? And so the Bible's going out of its way, right? It's giving these details to say that this is someone, this is not a normal being. This is, he it was a hybrid. And so, and so much so that his bed, his bedstead uh, was on display. Like it says in the capital of the Ammonite, not Amorite, the Ammonites in their kingdom, in, the, in their capital city of Rabbath. And so clearly there was something special about him that people even took his bed as a, as almost like a museum display item. Right. And so, but let's, let's continue and see some more details here about this King that I think, you know, what I want to explain is so, how can we, I think when we look at this passage, we can understand something important that, that I want to explain about the post-Diluvian giants, because it says that he's the last of the giants, but we know King Og was not the last giant on earth, right? Goliath, you know, centuries later, right? When King David was born and fought Goliath, he was fighting a Nephilim hybrid. So why does the Bible say he was the last of the giants? And I would submit that he wasn't the last of all giants. He was the last of those known as the Rephaim. And this is the important thing, distinction that a lot of times we see the description from Genesis 14, from the book of the early chapters of Deuteronomy of the various tribes or ethnicities of the giants after the flood, the Anakim, the Rephaim, uh, the Zamzumim, the Emims, right? We, and, and it's often assumed that, oh, these are just different uh, types of giants or different you know, uh, types of Nephilim. But what I submit is that all giants before the flood, their ethnic identity was Rephaim. They were all Rephaim. And so after the flood, when the giants reemerged, what we had two critical events. One was the Tower of Babel, right? The nations were scattered, supernaturally scattered by God, and the languages were confused. So out of the out of that, you have the post-Diluvian giants being scattered as well. And depending on where they lived, right, in the Middle East, the different people with different languages called them by that, by that particular name based on the new language they were given after the Tower of Babel dispersion. And so as a result, you had one group that was still called Rephaim. The formal original name of all the Nephilim giants was the Rephaim. And how can we know this? How can how can I be confident about this interpretation? Well, I think what we're going to see is there's there's there are some details in Scripture 
that I think support the fact that the Rephaim were that was the ethnic that was the ethnic name, so to speak, for the giants who were killed in the flood in the days of Noah. And we can see this when we look at the at the descriptions of Sheol or hell in the Old Testament. So let's take a look at that right now and try and work through uh, work through this interpretation. So the, to understand the Old Testament concept of hell known as Sheol, Sheol in, in the Old Testament. It wasn't the, the common conception where it's just a, a prison and a place of punishment for the wicked. It was a place for the wicked and the righteous. They were both there before the resurrection, the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Every, every person who died went to Sheol. So here's some quick examples here. We see in Luke chapter 16, Verses 19 to 23. And of course, this is the account that Jesus gives of the rich man and the beggar named Lazarus. And we read, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And isn't that comforting, right? That when you die, angels were there immediately to help escort you and carry you to, 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 to heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, um, yeah, so in, in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So they're in the same place. They're just separated. And later on in the passage explains there's a chasm in between them. But they both go to Sheol both the righteous beggar and the rich man who was in torments. And of course, we find out later on that he, he wants to communicate back to his brothers who are still alive and he's unable to do that. But, um, but let's continue in that passage and go to the next verse there. This is another really interesting passage. This is Psalm 86, verses 12 to 13. And this is a David writing. And he says, I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy towards me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. So this is just one of several Psalms where David references himself being in hell. Now, of course, David is a believer. He's a man after God's own heart, right? He's uh, certainly uh, was one of the most faithful, and I mean faithful to God, kings uh, in all of Israel's history. He never even considered worshiping an idol. Um and so yet he says his soul was going to be delivered out of the lowest hell. When? When, when Jesus leads captivity captive, right? And the souls of the righteous are let out of there. So that's just the background on Sheol. But there's another interesting detail we see in the writings of Solomon. And what we see here is, I think, a historical reference to the Nephilim who died in the flood in the days of Noah. So now that we have that backdrop, let's go to the next passage here. And this is where we see a reference to the Rephaim. Look at this. This is Proverbs chapter 9, verses 14 to 18. And this, of course, is talking about uh, the strange woman, the seductive woman who wants to lure men into fornication and adultery and sexual sin. And look what it says. It says, uh, for she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city to call passengers who go right on their ways. Whoso is simple, let him turn in thither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. So she's luring him by saying bad behavior is good. But he knoweth not, meaning the person who's listening to this sinful woman, but he knoweth not that the dead, Rapha, the singular, that is the singular version of Raphaim, the dead are there, the Rapha are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell, Sheol. Again, Proverbs 2. Verses 16 to 18, again, we see a similar reference to Rephaim. To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which, which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead, Rephaim. So again, we see that the dead in, in ancient Hebrew, Right. And this is ancient Hebrew theology and culture. Right. It's saying that they're calling the dead Rephaim. So they're synonymous with it. And I think that was an illusion that they became the Rephaim. Their death was so spectacular 
and so infamous in the ancient world that after the flood, the place, the dead souls were just referred to as Rephaim, Rafa. And that was the, that became the term for the dead. And so, um, and if you think about it, in many languages, in English, there are numerous, uh, obviously, references and terms for referring to the dead, the deceased. If people die on a ship, they say that how many souls were lost, right? We have many ways. And so I think this was a cultural illusion. And it's letting us know that the original Nephilim who died in the flood, they were all the Rafa, the Rephaim. But let's continue. Here's one, another example from Proverbs. It is joy. This is Proverbs 21, verses 15 to 16. It is joy to the just to do judgment, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. And again, it's Rafa, you know, the singular of Raphaim. And here's a, a quote here from an, a 19th century uh, biblical, biblical commentary, a comprehensive dictionary of the Bible in 1888. And the Reverend Sam Barnum wrote, an attentive consideration seems to leave little room for doubt that the dead were called Raphaim from the notion of Sheol or hell being the residence of the fallen spirits or buried giants. So again, look at that. He, he, the commentary, he's hitting it right on the nail on the head and saying that, look, this was the understanding. This was an illusion. And this became kind of the, the name, the slang or the cultural uh, term for the dead because of the because of the judgment of the Nephilim and how, if you think about it again, the ancient world, the Nephilim giants were overrunning the world. They filled the world with violence. They were corrupting humanity to the point of almost utter extermination, right? This is why when you look at the war against King Og, it's a rescue. God has to exterminate the Nephilim DNA to preserve humanity, to preserve our chance of redemption. And so I become infamous event in the ancient world. This is why they came out this way. Okay. So Okay, having a little technical issues. <laughs> okay. I think we are back. Sorry about that. Okay, now now we're now we're uh, now we're back. Thank you, Jesus. You know, this one talking about the enemy and the spiritual realm, and you know, the enemy wants to interfere. So uh thank you for your patience, but we're back now like and uh everything's functioning. So Looking at here, we have Isaiah chapter 14, verse 9, and it says, Hell, shield from beneath his movement. This is a verse I quote, I believe, is actually referring to the, the Antichrist from beneath his movement the, at thy coming. So, this is talking again, the, the abode of the dead. It stirreth up. Of the dead, Rephaim, the giants in the days of Noah, they were dominating the world. They were dominating earth and overrunning it. It calls them the chief ones. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. So again, it's this connection between the Nephilim and the dead. And we see here, here is a, a quote from a, a book, one of my one of my favorite books on the subject of Genesis 6, The Sons of God and Their, and their Inheritance by Emma Penny. And this is a book that I, I reference frequently uh, in Judgment of the Nephilim because I think her commentary, and she's just a laywoman writing on this, is just spectacular. And so let's see what she wrote on this point. These celebrated Rephaim, these men of renown, so again, she's clearly associating the Rephaim are the giants, are thus seen to be closely connected with the cast down giants, the fallen ones. The story of the giants who had been cast down to Tartarus, right? That is the, that's the Greek name for Sheol, for hell, was current among the Israelites. And it had, even at this early date, 
reached the stage where Tartarus had become a place inside the earth where men kept on living. Hence, they began to call all the dead Rephaim. This fact positively connects these Rephaim with the cast down giants. They were not ones. I mean, they weren't the fallen angels, but they were the men of renown, the children of those who afterwards became the fallen ones, children of the sons of God and daughters of men. And again, that's from the sons of God and their inheritance by Emma Penny in 1921. And so I think that I think that she's correct that what's taking place here is this was a, an ancient cultural association to just refer to all dead as Rephaim. So when we see after the flood a reference to the Rephaim, that's talking about the original ethnicity of all the giants after the flood. And I believe it was just because of the Tower of Babel, where God again scattered the people into different nations and confused the languages. That's why we start seeing different names for the post diluvian giants. And we'll look at a couple of, of examples of that as well that I think support this interpretation. Okay, so here's Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 10 to 11. It's talking about the Emims, and it says the who are post diluvian giants. And it says the Emims dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, which were also accounted giants. But it, it notice the Hebrew there is Rephaim. They were accounted as Rephaim, as the Anakim. So the sons of Anak, the Anakim and the Emims were actually called, were actually accounted as Rephaim. But the Moabites called them Emims. So again, notice what it says. They were actually Rephaim, but why did they have a different name? Because that's what the Moabites called them, because that's who they lived among. They lived among, and because of the Tower of Babel dispersion, the Moabites in their language called them Emims. Continuing in Deuteronomy chapter 2, you have here verses 20 to 21. There was also accounted a land of giants, again, Rephaim. Giants dwelt there in old time. Ammonites called them Zamzumims, a great a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, but the Lord destroyed them before destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. And again, that's Deuteronomy chapter two, verses twenty to twenty-one. And so again, what we're seeing here is this concept that they were that they were land they were called Rephaim. So all the giants were Rephaim. It's just that because of the Tower of Babel. You only had one group that was still called by that name. And King Og was the last of those Rephaim, of that original ethnic group of giants after the flood. And so that's, I think, you know, it's often kind of confusing as to why you see these different names, Emims, Anakims, Zamzumims, um, in the in the post-Diluvian world. I think that's the reason why in scripture, I think the details of scripture support that this is really a language thing. And that, so, of course, King Og was not the last of the giants. There were many giants after him, but he, he was the last of those called Rephaim. So we'll look at one last example here, and then um, I think we'll, we'll see some, uh, some, some uh, powerful uh, Nephilim giants. Okay, but as I wait for my 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 uh, verses to come up, um, I'll again just explain that something interesting about. Okay, here we go. Oh, this is really interesting, right? It goes into the battle itself, right? We see, and we're gonna look at the battle some more, but we see that how God defeated the Nephilim giants, and look how God speaks about this these battles against Sihon and King Og. This is Psalm 135. It says, praise you the Lord. Praise you the name of the Lord. Praise him, O ye servants of the Lord, who sent tokens and wonders into the midst of thee, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh, upon all his servants. So this is talking about the exodus, the supernatural of the Egyptian empire and Pharaoh, right? And right after this says, who, this is, so this is declaring the greatness of God's victories. And right after it says, who smote great nations and slew mighty kings. Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan. And of course, that's Psalm 
5, uh, verses 1 to 36. It says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He, he slew famous kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever, and Og, king of Bashan, for his mercy endureth forever. And that's Psalm 136, verses 1 and verses 18 to 20. So what is that showing? It's showing that, it, you know, the Bible, you know, the psalmist is ranking the Exodus, the victory in Exodus, the 10 plagues, the supernatural victory over Pharaoh and his armies, the most powerful army on earth at that time, and the deliverance of the Israelites by God, the Exodus. He's ranking it right up there with the victories over Og and Sihon. So this should show you again how important and how infamous and how imposing these Nephilim giants were. So, um, so yes, so that is uh, that takes me to uh, my answer on question number one on King Og. And I have one other example too I'll get to, but I, I can't remember the verse because I'm having some technical issues. So I have to correct, I have to fix my camera during the break. And um, but we'll look we'll look at some more some more verses on these two kings in a moment, but I'm going to go to our trailer on the final Nephilim audiobook, and we can enjoy that. And hopefully by that time we get back, I will have my uh, technical issues sorted out. So enjoy the trailer.
Okay, so hopefully we are back. I had some major technical issues, and so uh, Lord willing, we can continue and get to question number two. Okay, let's see here. We're gonna give it a shot. So question number two, did the Nephilim use fallen angelic technology? So uh, great question and let's get to it. So we looked at already at King Og, we established that he's a Nephilim, he's the last of the Rephaim, but what about the technology? Does the Bible give any indication of technology being used by King Og? And I think they do. And the scripture does provide that. So we're going to look at a couple of examples here, some of the details, again, from Deuteronomy that I think really, upon close examination, are kind of shocking when you look at this. So let's take a look at some of, some of the passages here. So here's one. So here's Deuteronomy chapter 3, and this is verses 4 and 5. And we looked at this already, but we're going to look at these details. So this is the battle now, again, when... God leads the Israelites in war against King Og. And notice what it says here. It says, we took all of his cities at that time. There was not a city which we took not from them. Three score cities, all the regions of Argob, the kingdom of Og and Bashan. So he had 60 cities. You know, we're talking about approximately 1600 BC and to 1500 BC. And he had 60 cities in a very, very small area, as we're going to see, because we're going to look at this area, uh, Lord willing, if the graphics will, will hold up. And so this the construction here was on an, an, an extreme scale for this era, right? We're in the bronze era of antiquity. And then, of course, as all these cities were fenced with high walls, gates, and bars. And I should have another passage here from Deuteronomy chapter 1. Again, we're referring to the Amorites, right? King Og and Sion were the kings of the Amorites. The people is greater than taller than we. The second highlighted passage there, the cities are great and walled up to heaven. So there was something in the construction ability of the Nephilim that gave them this incredible strategic advantage. And I believe it's because they, of course, had the knowledge of their ancestors, of the fallen angels, the sons of God, the Banai Ha Elohim, who were, of course, their forefathers. And so we see this, and I think, again, when we look at King Og, the idea of having a megalopolis, right? 60 cities constructed with these, with these incredible walls well up to heaven. I think the scripture is telling us to look a little deeper into some of the details about this king and his capabilities in his kingdom. Okay, we looked at this already, so I'm going to just go here. So, yes, let's just go right here. So, so, so just to set the table. So, there's some, so the area where of Bashan, right, the modern-day Golan Heights, this, of course, is east of the Jordan River. And this, the Israelites basically marched around Israel and had to go through the kingdoms of Sihon and Og to get to the Jordan River. In fact, I call them the gatekeepers of the Jordan River in judgment of the Nephilim. And that area, of course, in Bashan, the modern-day Golan Heights, at the time, in the, in, you know, once we reach about the 1700s and 1800s, you had Christians from Europe and America who wanted to go and explore the Holy Land. People, you know, technology... Uh, seafaring technology allowed for uh, for travel to the Middle East. And so you had people going out there and they were actually, so Josiah Porter has the most famous of actually going to this area. Unfortunately, we can't go there today because it's in Syria. It's a very hotly disputed, dangerous part of the world. But in, in the 19th century, you could go there. And Josiah Porter wrote, went to this area to see the ruins of the kingdom of Og. And let's look at some of the things he wrote. And so this is from the book called The Giant Cities of Bashan by Josiah Porter, writing again in 1865 after he came back. And he wrote, Moses makes special mention of the strong cities of Bashan and speaks of their high walls and gates. He tells us, too, in the same connection that Bashan was called the land of the giants or Rephaim, Deuteronomy 3, 13. Of course, we just looked at that. 
leading us to conclude that the cities were built by giants. Now, the houses of Kiriath, um, which is one of, the, one of the main cities in Bashan, and other towns in Bashan appear to be just such dwellings as a race of giants would build. I measured a door in Kiriath, and this is from him actually going and exploring the ruins. It was nine feet high, four and a half feet wide, and 10 inches thick. There can scarcely be a doubt, therefore, that these are the very cities erected and inhabited by the Rephaim, the aboriginal occupants of Bashan and the language, and it continues, but that's from the giant cities of Bashan. So this is his findings from exploring the actual ruins of the city of King Av. And so this is now, we're talking over 3,000 years later, these structures were still there. Here's another source. This is from Encyclopedia of Biblical Geography in 18, uh, 1866. And it says, when we see houses built of such huge and massive stones that no force could ever have been brought against them, that would have been sufficient to batter them down. When we find rooms in these houses so large and so lofty that many of them would be considered fine rooms in a large house in Europe. And lastly, when we find some of these towns bearing the very name that cities in that, con in that uh, country bore before the Israelites came out of Egypt, I think we cannot help feeling the strongest conviction that we have before us, the cities of the giant Rephaim. And so again, this is from another expedition to this area to see these homes. And they describe these huge hallways and entrances and doorways that again were built for beings of supernatural size. And so this is again uh, at a time when you could go and see these ruins. And I'll even show some images here from that Josiah Porter drew. Here is just some of the images that he, he it's an illustrated book. Uh, the giant cities of Bashan, where he, he draws what these ruins look like, the pillars, the walls, these structures. Here's some more drawings from Porter's book here of, 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 of how the Bashan looked, the ruins of Bashan. And again, this is remarkable that these structures stood for 3,000 years. And there's, there's a modern cover for his book that actually has one of the few photos of these ruins. So I'm going to bring those up now. And you can see here, these are some of the few photos that exist that we have access to of these ruins. And again, think about how old and ancient these cities are straight from the scripture. This is just the Bible coming alive. And so it is remarkable. But that's not all that's there. In the area of Bashan, modern day Golan Heights, right? The Golan Heights of today. In Bashan, there's also been another amazing discovery. First of all, the, the area is just dotted. There are numerous dolmens, these large megalithic structures um, all throughout the area of Bashan. But there's also a megalith and that is older than Stonehenge. And of course, that's Gilgal Rephaim. And some of you may be familiar with this already, but this is also in the exact area of the kingdom of Og of Bashan. And so I'll show you that. This is, oh, let me show you uh, Gilgal Raphaim. So here, let's get to it. This is known Gilgal in means the wheel of the giants. And so this, of course, this structure here, as you can see, it's, it's, it was built from 40,000 of basalt stone and it's remarkable put in, in these five centric circles with this 15 meter you see this little temple in the middle this burial area or shrine in the middle and it's just a remarkable um megalith and this is older than stonehenge which you know is considered one of the oldest megaliths in the world this is older and not only was it built on a hill that required a massive effort to bring these tens of thousands of tons of stones up onto this hill to construct this. It also aligns up with the sun during the solstices as well. So it's just an amazing, amazing um, example of this ancient Nephilim construction. And the amazing thing about this too is that when you're up close, you couldn't even 
tell what it is. It wasn't until 1967 during the Israeli Six Day War that an Israeli spy plane was flying over this structure. And from, from the air, you can clearly appreciate it. It's so big. In some places, circles, walls are 50 feet high. So it's very hard to understand exactly what the full shape is when you're there. Just remarkable. And so what I talk about in Judgment of the Nephilim is when you look actually at the construction of Gilgal Raphaim, it struck me how similar it was to the description of the city of Atlantis as described by Plato in his writing Critias. And so I'll show you here, and I put this in Judgment of the Nephilim, a side by side, right? So here is Gilgal Raphaim, and he, this is exactly how Plato gives the physical description of Atlantis, that it was islands built in five concentric circles with this shrine in the middle. I mean, you think about the account of Atlantis as told by Plato. It was this area, this ancient city that was built by the gods. The gods came, Atlas and, um, I'm sorry, Poseidon, and built this city. Why? As a place for his sons, who were the hybrid offspring of his marriage to a human woman. So you had a god coming to earth, marrying a human woman and having hybrid offspring. And they lived in this city with this advanced technology, just like the ancient world in the days of Noah. They had access to all these minerals. You look at the description of the Garden of Eden. They talk about the bedellium, the onyx, the gold that all ran through the garden in the ancient world. Um, and of course, you have the destruction of Atlantis that once sin overran and greed and evil overran Atlantis, it was destroyed in a flood. And of course, we see after the incursion of the fallen angels and the Nephilim giants, what do we see in the days of Noah? Wickedness, men thinking evil only continually in their minds, violence, war, and then a flood judgment sent from God. So again, to me, one, of course, I, of course, um, from my perspective, without a doubt, the account of Plato, all these accounts from ancient mythology the, of Atlantis is all a take, the Greek mythological take on Genesis chapter six and the days of Noah. But it's just remarkable to see that the truth, even in the myth, that the description of Atlantis was so similar to this type of structure we see uh, from, the, from the days and of the kingdom of King Og of Bashan. So just very remarkable. And I'll put that up there one more time. Just remarkable to see, really uh, mind blowing to me to see uh, what was taking place in the ancient world. And so that is my answer to question number two. Uh, hopefully we were able to make it through a lot less glitches. I'm gonna take one quick break and I think I might just jump to our overtime and winners because I, I don't want this uh, I like to keep a high quality technical program. And so if we're having, still having a lot of issues, I'm gonna check on it. We'll take a quick break and maybe I'll just do a couple of overtime questions and get to our winners. And if it's still, if it's actually working uh, smoothly, then I will get to question number three on the seven spirits of God. So let's see, let's get to a trailer. Why don't we look at, yeah, here's one we haven't looked at in a while. We, see, we already did the audio book. Uh, we did the paperback book of the final Netflix. And now we're gonna look at the documentary. This is the account that will take us to the culmination of the battle between Christ and Antichrist. I'm Ryan Peterson, author of The Final Nephilim. Okay, so still having a lot of technical issues, so I am going to uh, jump to our winners, and we're going to continue 
uh, this great discussion. I will do a part two on this because there's even more I want to share about the ancient technology and things from scripture and even how it relates to modern technology and transhumanism. So I will have to wait on that and uh, make sure I correct all our technical issues, but, um, but I'm not gonna leave without picking some winners. Let me take a quick look at some of the comments here. Dizzy B said Fibonacci miracle, everything is, is copied from God. Absolutely. I do believe in that the golden ratio, definitely. Okay, let's see here. I see Mark Eddy watching tonight. Shout out to Mark Eddy. Thank you, glad you're enjoying the show. Sorry, I, again, I apologize. Again, we have to, this is what happens, the challenges of one, live production, but also, uh, you know, we're talking a lot about the spiritual realm and revealing a lot of things about the enemy. So not surprised to encounter some of these things. So. All right, but I do want to make sure I get to some winners before anything else goes wrong. Um, so let me put up my banners so I can have my my uh, my socials. And again, I want to give two people are going to win a copy of the final Nephilim audiobook. So you can just email me, DM me, contact me through the website. All the links to all my social media, my website, it's all in the description of this video. Um, so I'm easy to find if you just click on the on the the uh, video description. And our first winner of the night is Vaughn Jones. So Vaughn, congratulations, you're the first winner. And um, our second winner is Stephanie. Don't have the last name, but Stephanie, you are the second winner. So hopefully you guys are both still, you all are both still in the room. Congratulations, again, just reach out to me and uh, you will be able to get your free copy of the Final Nephilim audiobook. So again, to be continued, I will not be uh, dissuaded so easily. I will definitely come back. We'll dig deeper into the Nephilim technology next week and some other exciting questions. And I'll get to the seven spirits of God. I had a great presentation on that as well. And we might even talk about a zombie apocalypse. Shout out to Animal Lover. He's been waiting on that question. So I think I might hit on the question of, is there a zombie apocalypse described in the Bible? to take place in the end times. You might be surprised by what people think about that. So um, again, a thank you for your patience. I promise to come back next week, Lord willing, with a, a less uh, glitchy and technical issues on my end. And um, thank you so much for watching. God bless you. And Lord willing, see you next Thursday. Ooh.